Hey everyone, it's another week of Find Your Film. This is for the week ending August 6th, 2021. The reason why I say this is because every week we try to cover as many movies as possible. A lot of them are going to be indie movies because, well, I don't like going to the theaters. I am actually, since um, since I live in LA and I'm one of the privileged few, actually the cursed many who actually live in Los Angeles, I've been getting a lot of screening invites, but I'm still very, very fearful of actually well, I've always, always been fearful of people, but I don't want to actually meet people again and go to screenings. Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes, have you guys been watching movies and actually, you know, just enjoying your time at the theaters the last several weeks or maybe the last couple of months? You guys have been actually, you know, going back to civilization and not hiding. I saw one. I saw one movie. <laughs> Bruce, you're, you're just you're just watching movies left and right on the movie theaters, right? You're, it's it's cool. Yeah, you're, you're good. I've been you're seeing good. about about one a week. Yeah. Okay, you're not scared. You're, you know, you put the mask and everything like that, and I put you know, the mask on. I sit behind people, so if anyone gets the germs, they get my germs, and I wear my mask, and I'm sitting in the back. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't know, Bruce. I I, I hear there's there's uh, pictures of Bruce Perky uh, just rolling around the theaters with a shirt that says, "Hey." Hi, I'm I'm asymptomatic, and then everyone just clears out, and he gets his own section of the theaters. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's good. You get your own your I own. I paint section. my body like I'm going to a football game. The <laughs> <laughs> big giant COVID on my chest. <laughs> well, kudos to you guys for actually returning back to the theaters. And again, we're going to talk about this in the episode. But Eric, what was that one movie that you did see over the weekend? Uh, that would be The Green Knight. Oh, the Green Knight! Yeah. Wow, I'm excited to hear what and, uh, you think about uh, it. I, I, I have a little. Uh, I actually have a little movie story. I can save it for the Green Knight if you want to. Just tell it now. You could say, "Wait, why don't we do this? Why don't we split it in half? We'll, we'll go halvesies, and let's hear your your personal story about the Green Knight going to the theater." All right. So basically, I, I believe the last movie I saw was either Tenet or uh, maybe it was uh, the New Mutants. Uh, right. so that, that, somewhere around there it was like okay. one of the last yep. movies I saw in the theaters. And uh, this was uh, the next time I've been through it, it, that I can remember. I'm sure I'm wrong, but whatever. It, it, it was the last movie we've seen in a long time. We'll see. Sure. Yeah. Um, and uh, I sit, you know, sit down, a bunch of people come in and a uh, uh, bunch of people sit next to me, which is fine. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not worried about, uh, you know, you get the, you get the vaccine, you know, everything's supposed to be fine. Uh, I guess the Delta variants out, so maybe I should be scared. But I, the thing about depression is that uh, uh, certain pandemics don't worry you too much. It's like, yeah. however, I got to go. I'm cool with it. But I thought but, this was well, going to be a happy story, Eric. What are you starting off the podcast with a depression, depressing story? Oh uh, well, it gives worse. <laughs> oh no, let's hear it. Let's hear it. So uh, uh, we're, it, we're here it, for you, Eric. We're here for it, you. Basically, all this to say, if I end up dying. Just know that I died doing what I love best, not living anymore. <laughs> Very cool. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so anyway, I, I go to the movie theater and I'm like, oh, the, the, this is going to be fun. And I, you know, order like a, a, a soda and a hot dog and all that. And I go sit mm-hmm. down and it doesn't like, there's not many people in the, uh, and when I choose my seat, there's not many seats pre-taken. And so I'm like, cool, I'm going to sit in the back on the far right. I usually sitting on the far left. I don't know why movies always seem better when I'm sitting on the far left. But for this time, sure. I'm sitting on the far right. And then uh, the movie starts, and then a bunch of people just sit, come sit right next to me. I'm like, motherfucker. Oh, well, all right. <laughs> the, the, you know, I should be happy. This is a new David Lowry movie. You could be. They, they, they should be entitled. They should, yeah. The, hey, the, this should be a wonderful thing. The, the, yes. the theater is is filling uh, out the yeah. way it is. Yeah. And it, it it's filling out pretty good. Um, mu- you know, much more so than uh, Tenant and uh, what fuck? What else? I see the new the new mutants, but, which you kind of like. Yeah. I remember that you kind of yeah. kind of yeah. Oh no, there was another. Oh, in, that that's beside the point. It doesn't matter. That there was another movie I saw afterwards. But anyway, um, so the the place is filling up, and then uh, then uh, the Green Knight starts, and we'll we'll talk more about the Green Knight itself. But the movie's going on, and this guy's eating popcorn, which is fair. They sell popcorn there. People eat popcorn. It's a staple of mo- the movie going experience. Eating popcorn. So Eric, basically everyone was sitting next to you. So what the, okay. so then what happened? 
all right so everyone's sitting next to me and uh the movie starts and you know the the people are eating popcorn which is it's a staple of the movie going experience so i'm not gonna yeah. you know I, I, there's nothing wrong with that everyone goes to the movie everyone needs popcorn and we're half hour into the movie and the guy's still eating popcorn with his mouth open i yes, apparently yeah. he, ne- he never learned how to eat with his mouth closed which is fine different people learn different things at different points in the <laughs> Oh, very good. Thank you, Bruce, for that very beverage. And what beverage is that? Is it Coke or maybe a nice a little light cola? I, RC I, cola? Wanted to, I wanted to add to the, um, the, the, you know, the oral Sound- um, soundscape. Yes. And f- folks, when he man- means oral, the, uh, this is a clean, uh, even though explicit, I want it to be clean. He means A-U-R-A-L, oral show. If it's the other kind of oral, I only <laughs> sing. I only sing during that. There you go. So uh, it's the, a little foreshadowing. Just to, the, the, guy good, was, the guy must have got a literal bottomless uh, thing of popcorn, which, which is fine. Um, the, <laughs> and he had some people with him that I, I don't know if they constantly had to go pee. Yeah. Um, you know, people have incontinence. That's fine. That's yeah. That's a yeah. perfectly yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, a, a natural yeah. thing that happens to some people. Yeah, that's, that's why. That's uh, why I always may, take an aisle seat. I'm, a, I'm an aisle guy. You yeah. know, some people, some people get dehydrated. Maybe sure. have to go get water. They're constant. Like po- people are constantly getting up and moving all the time. So I just got up and I, I looked around the theater and spotted a part down front, and I sat there the whole time and watch the rest of the movie. <laughs> so yes. it, uh, it, it made me appreciate the screeners we get from time to time. Oh, <laughs> we'll uh, just say. Bruce, do you hear what this, this Eric Holmes suddenly turns into this privileged movie critic say, Hey, can just, you yeah. know, I'm, I'm just gonna, first of all, Eric Holmes, I understand now after all these years, I know you're true, like Bruce Perker, you're a true blue movie fan, but now you're, you're heading over to, to the dark side. Hey, you, hey, un- hey, hey yeah. here's the thing. Like, and the odd thing is, if I went to the movie theater to watch the Star, uh, Star Wars, yeah. I would expect that because that's just what happens. I didn't expect it for the Green Knight. But I guess the, the good thing is that <laughs> there were enough Star Wars fans that came to see the Green Knight that yes. annoyed me in the way that they would during a Star Wars movie. I, I saw that as a sign of hope well, that, that, that certain indie movies might be getting a little more um a little more push uh you know That's wh- wh- whether you like the movie or not is irrelevant but the idea that people are going out to see something other than an mcu movie or a star okay. wars movie i i thought was kind of hopeful no oh. uh, well I- i'm glad you're hopeful my my job as your your fellow uh, colleague is to make sure you and bruce by the end of this whole podcast run you w- will both be disillusioned and will watch <laughs> movies the way they should be seen on a screening link via an email on your iPhone. That's the way we're going to watch movies from now on. Right, Bruce? Is that the way we're going to do it? What do you think? Uh, watch. On my watch. Is my watch. <laughs> That's even worse. Or maybe my, even my, my Dick Tracy watch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that is your experience. Well, overall, we're going to get to the Green Knight. Very, you know what? Here, here's a little teaser. I'm going to ask Bruce Perky. I, he has his own thoughts on the Green Knight. I'm assuming Eric Holmes really absolutely fell in love with him, with this movie. Let's see what Bruce Perky, who I believe, teasing wise, are you a fan of David Lowery, Bruce Perky, like Pete's Dragon, a ghost story, ancient yes, body yes. saints? Okay, all right. There oh, you I'm go. talking. It's one of the my top two anticipated movies of the year. The Green Knight. Great, great. And the so, other one is my top one from the year, and that's Annette. So I've got two wow. of my top most anticipated movies of the year in this episode. Yes, and we're covering what is, how do you pronounce his name, Bruce? You are the expert. Is it Leos or Leos Carax? Is that how we pronounce that filmmaker's name? Yeah, Leos Carax. Yes. Leos Carax. We are, that's going to be our main review this week. Okay, let's just face it. It's Annette. It's two hours and 20 minutes. It is a musical, or is it a musical? What is it? We're going to tell you. It comes out in select theaters this Friday, August 6th. We're also going to be covering a movie called Naked Singularity, aka what? what basically Greg is on a Friday night. He's singing. <laughs> he's very singular and he's naked. So that is uh, that is my horrible joke uh, of the, of the, I have you know, the pictures to prove it. Yeah. And, and Eric Holmes <laughs> has the pictures to prove it. It stars one of, I'm assuming one of Bruce Perky's favorite actors. He's always been praising the talents of John Boyega. So he is the lead. He and Olive, Olivia Cook are the leads of Naked Singularity. Also, I'm assuming Bruce Perky is a fan of Olivia Cook because he loves her from Me and Earl and the Dying Girl and, of course, Sound of Metal from last year. 
And last but not least, or maybe least, we're going to be covering a thriller, a horror film, or maybe it's a family drama. What the heck is this movie? It's a movie called John and the Hole. Eric Holmes, when you saw the, the I guess, the screening link for the IFC Films link for John and the Hole, were you thinking this might be the, some kind of scary movie? The movie stars Michael C. Hall, by the way. And also, what's the name of the girl from St. Maud? I'm, I'm just blanking on her name, but she's very, very good in this movie. So before we do, before we get into our featured films, do you guys have anything to plug, anything to say? Of course, on our podcast feed for Find Your Film, if you want to check out some insight on the, I believe his name is Tom, Tom Laughlin. Is that his name? Tom Laughlin film, Billy Jack. Bruce Perky and Eric Holmes join groupers actor Travis Stansberry to talk about the wonders or maybe the, is, is Billy Jack dated? Is it is it a really good movie? They will tell you in their recap. How is it? Yes, Eric. Yes, sir. I was going to say both are correct. <laughs> <laughs> is dated and it is very good <laughs> okay so check out that that little mini pod that they did with travis and he's so good in groupers by the way and that is recently on our recent podcast feed this week also eric holmes bringing in the big guns cinematically can you tell our listeners what we are supposed to look forward to later this month especially on august 18th what are we yes yes uh well as we're recording this uh two weeks from today we're going to have a special guest join us, a Juan Diego Escobar Alzate, the director of Lose the Flower of Evil, is going to join us. And we're going to have some uh, we're going to have some posters and DVDs to give away. Um, uh, and- no, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. We're not. No, no, no. You're not. We're no. not. You're not giving it away because what's going to happen is we're actually going to uh, transparency, fo- transparency, folks. This is a podcast. We're on the up and up. Eric Holmes says it's going to be a, because because Loose Flower, Flower of Evil is, is a great movie has you know shirts whatever like posters giveaways he's going to just reroute them to my address <laughs> and I'm going to put them up on eBay so Bruce I don't know if you're in on the it's a big it's a big scam hopefully I, Bruce and Eric actually I, in all seriousness that is so cool though the giveaway no seriously yeah. talk about the giveaway yeah well, yeah we're not we're not giving them away we're not giving them away on eBay <laughs> to give them away to our <laughs> listeners. Um, but I, I know that there's uh, some people that have uh, that may have seen Lose a Flower of Evil already. Uh, some may have not, but uh, um, it's he's going to be on on the show in two weeks. So I, uh, you know, I would ask everyone if you want uh, watch Lose a Flower of Evil because we're probably going to talk spoilers. And the movie's kind of uh, the movie's really dense and it's got a lot to say. So maybe if you got some questions. For Juan Diego, maybe uh, send them to us and we will ask him when we have him on the show. But I'm very excited about this. Uh, I, I talked to him over uh, Messenger and he's seems like a really cool guy and I cannot wait to meet him screen to screen. And this is going to be real fun. I'm very excited for this. Screen to screen. As I'm sure a lot of you people in our Find Your Film universe know that my North Star is filmmaker Brian De Palma. He's, he's a guy I'm really obsessed with. Bruce Perky, I'm thinking of your big obsession recently, just recently. Bruce Perky's big obsession is PG, PG for short, short, PG Psycho Gorman. He's really into that. He has some PG Psycho Gorman merch. I believe he has a Blu-ray. He has a lot of stuff that, right, Bruce, am I correct on this? Uh, yeah, I got a Blu-ray. I've got the the glasses. Remember, I got yes. the, the the glasses and the little um, Happy Meal. <laughs> got the yeah. PG Psycho Gorman Happy Meal. Yes. Yeah. So if, if Bruce is PG Psycho Gorman, PG for short, I'm Brian De Palma, apologist and defender. Eric Holmes is a loose flower of evil enthusiast. You have been, what is this about? What is it about this specific film? Just a, you know, 10 second, 20 second pitch on why this movie still stays with you and why you're excited to have him on board on our, on our podcast. I, it has a uh, little to do with everything. This, this movie to me is pure art. It, it's just the, the way uh, it looks, you know, the, the way the mood that it sets um, the, the message about, you know, the, you know, hold, holding religion's feet to the fire, uh, mm-hmm. in a way, in a matter of speaking, um, and the fact that it's just uh, it's just kind of gross and gory sometimes. You know, the the visceral uh, portion of horror that that I respond to, just that everything about this movie is like, if I made a movie, I could only hope that it's as good as Lose a Flower of Evil. Hi, compliments from Eric Holmes. Before we get into our feature reviews, just a little. Little uh, message via email. We're talking about email and screening links. Miss Perky and Eric Holmes do not know this yet, but as of next week, next week ending, what is it? Next week ending August 13th, we will be reviewing one of the movies we will be reviewing for our next podcast next week. 
is the movie Howling Village. It is a horror thriller. Bruce Perky is currently nodding his head. It is from writer, director Takashi Shimizu. I am ignorant. Bruce, can you tell the listeners why this is this could be an interesting film? I'm pretty sure, and I could be wrong. You're Don't not. Yell at me if I am not. Uh, but if I am wrong, <laughs> I'm pretty sure he's the director of the original Grudge. And I think the first American remake was also by him as well. So Jean on the Grudge. So it could be interesting. Okay. I've never seen the original. Was it any good? There's like five versions of it. I mean, yes, the Japanese and the original, original American version. They're both pretty good. Okay, Eric, have you yeah. seen any of that stuff, the, the grudge stuff? Have you seen any of that stuff when you were? Uh, I, I saw, so I saw the, the, the first American remake, um, and I kind of, it, it just wasn't, I, I was in, uh, I was in hipster film, <laughs> film person. It's whoa, like, whoa. oh, whoa, it's a remake. A hip- I didn't like it. Um, and uh, then I saw no. the recent grudge and hated that movie. Uh, I, <laughs> oh, I have yeah. not seen the original. Right. That was I can just tell you when you watch the original Grudge, don't let your probably two and a half year old son walk into the room behind you while the that sound is being made by the creepy <laughs> lady. That is so weird. You know what? I the reason why I've been delaying this podcast is because look, you know what? Let's without further ado, let's just start. Let's just start with Annette. It is a Moby Dick of a movie, and I mean this literally. Original story and music by Sparks. Here's the thing that you have to understand. When you say original story, it's by Sparks. They're a music group that I'm sure, I think Eric Holmes likes, if I recall. He saw the Edgar Wright documentary. Yep. Yeah. Okay, no, so- I, I, I didn't see that, but I, I do like Sparks. You, okay, so you have always been a fan of their music, which they, is very yeah. Cool. They did uh, they did a uh, they did a um, collaboration with Faith No More. And I'm a huge Faith No More fan, so right. obviously I came across that. So I, ever since then, I've been a Sparks fan as well. Okay, fair enough. Now this movie is directed by Leos Carax and Bruce. What are some of Carax's previous works that we've talked about on our Find Your Film podcast? Uh, we did a show on Holy Motors and The Lovers on the Bridge. Okay, now this one, this movie, Annette, French filmmaker, right? It's not set in, it's not set in France, 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 France. It's set in Los Angeles. It's a musical because you've, I'm sure some of you listeners have heard some of the music from the trailer, or maybe some of the, you've actually heard some of the songs on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, whatever. Very good music. And it simply centers on the relationship, the LA relationship between a stand-up comic named Henry Henry, played by Adam Driver, a stand-up comic, and he has a very passionate relationship with his opera singer named Anne, played by Marianne Cotillard. And they live seemingly a blessed life because they're both high high level in, in their craft. Okay. They're both very popular. And when they bond together as a couple, everything should be hunky dory. They live in LA. They live, they live in a beautiful wooded house somewhere off, maybe out into the mountains in, in Los Angeles. Everything looks picture perfect. There's a ton of musical numbers in this movie. There's, I don't think there's any, even, even uh, too much dialogue. The whole movie is a sing-through kind of dialogue. Everyone sings throughout the movie, especially Adam Driver. Yeah, two hours and 20 minutes. Bruce Parkey, I credit you for actually preparing me and stealing me for the entire film. Actually, as much as Eric and I are going to talk about our initial thoughts, I think the one who's going to provide the Muhammad Ali knockout punch for this review will be Bruce Perky because he, he actually, thank you. Thank you, Eric, for that shadow boxing. But yeah, he's got to really provide a lot of insight because he's actually seen this movie twice. So let's just start off with the inconsequential. I'm inconsequential too, because I'm writing, I'm waiting for Bruce's, Bruce's big review. Eric, was this movie maddening? What, did you find it inspiring? Did you find it incoherent? What was, what were your overall feelings about this movie? Yes. <laughs> yeah, yes. uh, the, I, I love this movie. Um, right, oh, right. Whoa, whoa, love this movie. You are, are you yes. like unash- unabashedly love this movie. Yes, yes. Oh, it, it, oh. It's um, at, after watching uh, Lovers on a Bridge and uh, especially, especially uh, Holy Motors, I kind of had an idea of what to expect. Not exactly, but you know, kind of knew in the ballpark. And then uh, this movie starts off with uh you know, Sparks playing, uh, 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 what, what's it? Can we be good? Or so, uh, so, so can we may start? We start. Yeah, so yeah, may we start? Or something. Yeah, so, so may we start? start. Yeah. And then uh, they start may playing. We start. And, and they get up and they start walking towards the camera. And then, uh, and then Adam Driver and Marion Cotillard comes towards the camera. And then like a bunch of people, they, they do that same thing. They did that probably my favorite scene in, in Holy Motors with the, with the, uh, 
the accordion and then everyone's following them. They, they kind of open up. Right. And, and, and that it, with, with that scene. It seems and like right, a very virtual virtuoso no take sequence when they're walking the streets of Los Angeles, by the way, Eric, that streets of Los Angeles, when you're walking, that's where I used to live for about 10 years in downtown, yeah. downtown Los Angeles. So, well, uh, yeah. when I come out to visit you again, you and I are going to hold hands and walk that exact same one shot. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <laughs> we're going to sing it as we walk. It. No, 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 no. We're going to hold hands. We're going to sing it and we're going to skip. We're going to skip too. Um, hey, skip skateboard. I don't care. We're going to do all <laughs> that, all this stuff. But so right, so right away, I'm like, all right, uh, we're, we're in Holy Motors territory and I'm here for it. And then uh, it goes on to uh, uh, Adam Driver doing a weird... It was weird. It was like a, a stand up, like stand up comedy, but this is a musical. So it kind of had kind of a musical notes to it. And, and yeah, the, the movie just kept getting stranger and stranger as it goes along. And as it goes along, I'm like, I don't even give a care. And at one point, one point during the movie, I looked up uh, the writer, you know, just to see if anyone other than Leo's cracks wrote it. Come to find out, Leo's cracks didn't write it at all. Yeah. It was the Sparks brothers that wrote it. And I'm like, oh, this totally makes sense. All right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the movie just keeps getting weirder. And I I think um, where this movie, I think, uh, succeeds more than Holy Motors is that the satire of this movie is more clear. The, that it's, you know, about uh, fame and uh, putting your life out in, in public. Uh, they have issues of uh, uh, cancel culture that that's really big. They have issues of uh, child actors and, you know, the morality of uh, putting children out for, you know, everyone to see and people like us who say the four year old didn't work for me. They're a terrible acting. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and it's yeah, also, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, this movie just worked on me on, on so many different levels. I don't, uh, know that it'll work for everyone. I would say that Holy Mo, I would say that Holy Motors is a good, um, barometer. Like, if you watch Holy Motors and you hated it, this isn't going to be the Lu- Lewis or Leo's Corrects movie that wins you over. Uh, if you watch Holy Motors and you're like, hell yeah, you might be ready for something like this. Um, and uh honestly like i yeah i think i mentioned this the the bruce um this movie's gonna win a lot of awards whether those awards are razzies or oscars remain to be seen well there's it's an inch there's so many themes in this movie like eric was saying also one of the things that i think you as listeners or viewers can point out is it's not too much giving too much away but the way henry henry performs a stand-up comedy what which eric alludes to even though he's singing he's singing throughout the, this entire most of the, most of his routine, his he tells he tells Anne that his main goal is to punish the audience, to punish the audience and overcome them, pretty much dominate the audience with his shtick or with his uh, aesthetic approach. While Anne, as the opera singer, she's more about giving, saving their lives and giving them emotion and giving art to the people who watch the, that performance, her performances, and she gets gratif- she she gets gratified. She receives gratification just from actually receiving that kind of emotional connection with the audience. So you know right from the beginning, there's going to be an artistic clash between these two lovers. There are more clashes as the narrative goes. Before we get to you, Bruce, I would say the, my, my caveat, we have to say caveat every week. My caveat to this movie is, yes, if you love Holy Motors, dive into Annette. If you are expecting a pure musical, watch the opening moments and then just turn the whole thing off. Because this storyline, if you follow this storyline, it will really, I think, a lot of people will be disappointed with the actual execution of the story. People who do not know much about Carax's universe, what to expect. But if you actually enjoy it for the aesthetics, which is the music, the visual compositions, you're going to be blown away. This is a tour de force cinematic experience. This is one of actually, I'm thinking about it right now. It's one of my favorite films of the of the year, but it's just a warning. It's the same thing about the storyline. I don't know. There's it gets to a certain point midway through the movie that we don't want to talk about. That I was like, "Wow, weird shift," but not gonna fault it. Bruce, your thoughts? Well, I I went on a roller coaster ride with this movie. I, I kind of did what you did with Lovers on the Bridge. If you remember, if I remember correctly, your original 
review on Lovers on the Bridge, it's like for the first half, you were like, what is happening? And you were like, oh, this is going to be terrible. And then eventually you kind of got into it and it, you ended up liking it. Yeah, um, it. yeah. And this movie kind of worked the same for me. And I love Holy Motors. So something wasn't just clicking with me. I wasn't quite getting the rhythm. I wasn't quite getting the tone. I wasn't quite connecting with me. And probably at about the hour mark, there's, let's just say we meet Annette. I'm just going to say that we meet Annette, which I would say Annette is perfectly cast in this movie. And we meet Annette. And then I was like, okay, I'm, I'm in now. It's gone to the weird level that my brain is, is just clicked. It's just turned over. And from there on, I was on board and I went back and rewatched it, as you said. And I was able to much more appreciate the first half the, the second time around. And one of the things that kind of struck me, I think part of it is the music. So you think of musicals, right? You're going to have lots of ballads. You're going to have these melodic moments. You're going to have high emotion. You're going to have these kind of broad strokes. Weirdly, the music doesn't work in that way in this movie very much. Like the broad strokes are non-musical. The music is almost, and I started finding it hitting it. And the, the music is really repetitious, first of all. Like they repeat lines over and over and over again in almost every quote song. And it's almost like, it's almost like obsessive thoughts from whatever character it's, it refers to or from the audience. And they keep just like, it's almost like when you're mulling over something and it's just nagging at you or bothering you. And it kind of works like that. And when I kind of struck that tone, it really helped me. Also, the other thing that really struck me was as it goes along, the world becomes more and more like a stage and like an opera. And uh, it's almost like we sink into Anne's world. Like we, we fall away from his world, um, Henry McHenry, and fall into Henry Anne's McHenry. world. And it's really interesting. If you watch it, you really get a lot of aspects. There's one point where she's on stage and she walks into a forest and it becomes like a real forest. And then she walks back into the stage. And I think that's pretty important because he's doing a lot of that kind of stuff in here where there's certain stages that are highly artificial on purpose. And uh, I, I ended up loving this movie too. I, I actually adore this movie. I think this movie is wonderful. And I think it's gonna, for people who do click with it even a little bit, I think rewatches are gonna make it really solidify. And a bunch of people are gonna probably walk out of this movie. And I love the fact that in the lyrics in the first song, you know, May We Start and all that stuff, it talks about all these things. And at one point he says, oh, the exit sign's over there for those who need it, basically. <laughs> he even <laughs> says that to the audience at the beginning. He's like, okay, guys, some of you are going to walk out of this. And that's fine. <laughs> I'm showing you the way. Movies like Singing, Singing in the Rain, it's a tribute to musicals. It's an homage. La La Land is an homage to musicals as well, but it's also a bittersweet romance. But both of these movies appeal to a mass audience, mass cinephiles. Do you think it's pretty gutsy that they that Karak's and Sparks, you know, Sparks Brothers, Sparks decided not to go that route with the musical because it is a musical, but it doesn't it doesn't placate to those tropes. Well, I suppose. Well, well, it doesn't it doesn't placate to the tropes. In fact, it it points them out. <laughs> right. the, like you have uh, you have uh, Marion Cotillard and uh, and uh, uh, I said his name twice. And I forget his name. Kylo Ren. <laughs> oh, Adam Driver. Yeah, Adam Driver. Adam Driver, yeah. sorry. I, I shouldn't have done that. But uh, Adam Driver and Mary <laughs> Cotillard are skipping and they're singing and they're doing that. They're doing the scene where you see the two people in love. And that that's not the only time they do that. Uh, I can't think of any offhand, but there there's a couple scenes where the the lyrics to the song is exactly what's happening. And and so um it, it's almost saying. Uh, this is this is that part of the movie right now. So we're just gonna get through it, and we're gonna say exactly what it is. It, it, it almost works as is a satire of these type of movies. Um, it's mm. kind of making fun of what it's doing, I guess. I, you know, whether that's brilliant or on the nose or whatever, I I don't know. But I I thought it was kind of funny. I I just looked at it as a uh, humorous more more than anything. It's also yeah, a piece we also. For yeah, go oh, ahead. I was going to say, you, 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 I'll say something. I know you're saying a feast for the eyes. I agree with you on that. Yeah, pretty much. Um, I was going to point out Adam Driver has a couple of kind of long, almost monologues. Like he has two, two big performances as his like asshole provocateur comedian slash social right. commentator dude. Right. And the second one in Vegas. 
alone, that alone, just for an acting standpoint is fucking incredible. And he does a lot of really great stuff in this movie, but that alone is just like, if you watch it, because the second time I just kind of watched him do it. And I was just like, where he's playing back and forth and he's playing, he's playing Anne and he's playing himself and he's playing Anne and he's talking about what's happening. And it's like, Oh yeah, it's, it's, yeah. that's pretty. No, I mean, he'll, he's he should, just doing it. He should receive an Oscar nomination for this, for his role. It's amazing. What this is pretty much, let's face it. Movie's called Annette, but it's Adam Driver's movie. And, Respect to Annette, though. Annette was awesome. Eric? <laughs> I, I also wanted to say that uh, uh, it, without giving anything away, what Bruce said earlier about uh, Annette being perfectly cast goes to show you how brilliant Bruce is at comedy. <laughs> 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 but, uh, uh, oh, yeah, go, go, go ahead. <laughs> you know, there, there's a scene towards the, end, towards the end of the movie where I'm just, if I'm just breaking it down story-wise, where I want the story to go, it is. I am totally not wanting the story to go this way, but the whatever is in that story, that frame, what's going on with the singing, the people in that frame, blown away. And this is one of those rare things where it doesn't matter where the story goes. When you're in a Leos Corax film, you're just you can have you can actually nitpick the the narrative if you want, but really it's there for the I, I suppose for the overwhelming sensory experience of the whole thing and. Yeah, this is what, this is one of the movies that just absolutely swept me away without and I don't have I don't need any logic. I just absolutely love Annette. Strong recommendation. Movie can hits theaters August 6th, but for most people, you'll be able Prime Video fans, Prime Video users, you'll be able to actually stream it on August 20th. Eric Combs, final thoughts on this? Strong recommendation. Um, yeah, definitely a strong recommend. Uh uh caveat to uh you know that yeah, i mean some people are i, I mentioned this is going to win a lot of awards be it oscars or razzies i think there's people that are going to watch this that are going to hate it but i think there's going to uh, i think even i i suspect the people that even hate it like it'll it'll burrow in their mind yeah, yeah. they're not going to get it out of their mind Ooh, and not to give away the ending I won't give away anything of any, but that got me crying like a little. Okay. I, I, I was, I was crying. Whether those are happy tears, those could be sad tears. Those could be just filled with awe tears or maybe all three. I don't oh, know. No. We'll see. How about you, Bruce? <laughs> but, you but yeah, the, the ending totally worked for me and stick around for the credits and read the credits. Cause uh, they do a, they do a thing. Um, the credits almost kind of work like uh, they reminded me of the CD jackets, like the printing of the CD jackets. You got the names of the songs and everything like they start. You know how like when you watch the credits, it starts with their cast and goes through everything. The credits start with all the songs, which is usually at the end of the credits. And then it does the normal credits. And then at the end, uh, it, it has uh, everyone involved in the movie and their thank yous. And, you know, like Lewis cracks, thanks so and so and so and so. Uh, I will give this away. <laughs> Adam Driver <laughs> thanks Chris Rock and Bill Burr and no one else. <laughs> nice. And so th th this is a this is a very rare uh, occasion where they actually put um, thought into the credits, which usually remember they had the I, I don't know if you remember they had the thing on on Twitter where people are like, oh Netflix is cutting out the credits, fuck them, blah blah blah. And it's like, dude, I saw your movie. You had a uh, white white letters and black background, same as every other credits. You put zero effort into your credits, and you're you're mad that Netflix <laughs> is skipping over them. Leo's cracks, not the same case. Uh, yeah, it it that they're fun. Like that that's how detailed this this filmmaker is. Even the credits are worth sticking around for. Well, uh, and it's also got in the credits. It's got the whole cast like reprising their role at the beginning. Yeah. And they're all walking along and they're singing and they're saying stuff. And you're basically, they're basically saying goodbye to the audience. Just like they said, hello to the audience. Oh yeah. They, they even sing the part that, uh, yeah. If you have no friends, at least tell a stranger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so good. This movie's okay. so good. So that is Annette, all three of us. Bruce, one, so one, a top film for you, at least a top 20 maybe for this movie. Oh yeah. This, this is probably at this point, it's top five. It's top wow. five for me. Okay, you heard it here, folks. Top five for Bruce Perky. This is Annette, directed by Leos Carax, starring Marion Cotillard, Adam Driver, and let's just call her 
Annette. Annette is a, she stars in the movie as and, well. And written by Sparks. And ri- written by Sparks, music by Sparks. And by the way, we didn't really cover much about the music, but the music is fantastic in this movie. You're not there. I guess what do you call them? Earworms? Yeah, they just you'll. If anyone's if anyone's played uh, uh, Link's Awakening on the Nintendo Switch, the remake, there's uh, there's that. Da, 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 da. I can't remember the name of the song, but if you played Link's Awakening, you know the song I'm talking about. Um, that's very similar to Annette's theme song in this. It's beautiful. And I kind of wish they had it on YouTube so I can listen to it on repeat. Okay. So that is a lot of love behind Annette. Next up is Naked Singularity. Opens in select theaters, August 6th, Friday, August 6th. John Boyega, we all love John Boyega. He plays a Manhattan defense attorney. He's trying to do a good job. He's trying to, he's trying to give his clients the benefit of the doubt, or even if, you know, even if some of his clients are, are guilty, he is a public defender. He's trying to get justice for them to make sure that maybe if they're going to jail, maybe they'll be in good conditions, or maybe if they're really rehabbing, he's trying to give them, help them get a second shot. Unfortunately, the justice system, the justice system here is symbolized, or, or we see the justice system in this movie played by the, the judge played by Linda Lavin from Alice. Shout out to Alice and Linda Lavin. She's very, she's very wonderful in this in this movie. She she's a judge who actually beats down, physically not literal not physically but just emotionally. He beat she beats down all of these cases that that John Boyega's character tries to bring. Yeah, John Boyega plays the lawyer named Cass, and um, yeah, he's my bad, Cassie. So yeah, Cassie's trying his best. To, he's trying to be, he's trying to do the good thing, but it seems the system is beating him down. Now, what happens is a former client played by Olivia Cook, she is in the middle of a, a big, big problem. She is part of a impending drug heist because she works, I guess, at the local impounding center. Okay. And she there is a car that has a lot of a lot of uh, what is it, drugs, like $15 million worth of drugs. I believe it's either cocaine or heroin, heroin, doesn't really matter. And she is embroiled in a drug heist with this hoodlum, this criminal played by Ed Screen from Deadpool. And yeah, so she's involved in that drug heist. Cassie ultimately becomes involved with Olivia Cook's character. And he's thinking maybe, who knows, maybe it might be interesting to see whether he can either become part of the drug heist or actually try tries to save his client, again, played by Olivia Cook, away from this life, continued life of crime. It's described as a neo-noir. And it also, yeah, it's, that's what it is. It's an interesting movie. Written and directed by Chase Palmer, based on the book by Sergio de la Pava. Bruce Parkey, what did you think of this movie, Naked Singularity? Was it interesting for you? Did it work? It didn't totally work. It was interesting. I, I wasn't really bored by this movie. It didn't anger me. Uh, it was it was often kind of confusing and messy. I feel like it was a, a little bit all over the place, but I had a lot of fun watching it. I mean, everyone was kind of chewing their rolls up a little bit. I mean, you didn't mention, I don't think Bill Skarsgård, he's also in this and he's kind of this coked out hyper lawyer friend, sort of. Yeah. Judo <laughs> of partner, John, judo partner of, of Cassie. John Boyega's character. And the other thing yeah. you didn't mention, there's this whole aspect of the singularity and like conspiracy theories. And is there like a, something happening to the universe or something? Well, the, I, I, yeah. There's an I opening mean, yeah. line by Candide in the thing yeah. about different worlds. Like maybe they're talking about different worlds this, in this. This feels like a book turned into a movie because as I was watching this, I felt like it's like this was, I feel like this was a longer script and they kept tearing out pages because every so often I was like, wait, who, wait, why did they do that? Wait, what, where? Oh, okay. I know what we're doing again. And I had to keep like kind of re- recalibrating myself to figure out like why a character was doing something or what was going on. Um, overall, I would say it's a, it's a fun enough watch. It doesn't, it's kind of a mess and it has a lot of interesting parts that don't quite gel, but it's good enough to, to check out. I personally, I would have liked it to get a little weirder, a little more surreal or to pay that part of the story off a little bit more than it did. And the high stuff was okay, but a little more kind of normal. So I, I kind of wanted it to be even weirder a little bit. I could see for, for example, I can imagine, Carpenter making this movie, John Carpenter, like in 1981, 
And I can imagine it being just as bonkers and kind of weird, but working somehow a little more. With, with Adrian Barbeau in the Olivia Cook yeah, role. Totally. Maybe <laughs> Kurt Russell in the John Boyega role, right? Some, something like that. No, yeah. I would have, uh, what's his name from uh, The Thing? Uh, the guy next to Kurt Russell at the end. What was that guy's name? I can't think of his name know. now. Wilfred Brimley. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, Wilford Brimley. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I could uh, slight it's, recommend it's, for you. I'd say it's a slight recommend. Go in knowing it's kind of a mess, but it's kind of a fun mess. It's it didn't bore me, and and it's it's just kind of this is a hey, it's on cable TV tonight. Yeah, sure, I'll watch this. You know, that kind of what, movie. What about you, Eric? Well, I mean, it is a courtroom drama. <laughs> and then they add in uh stuff with the science and space is this movie's like tailor made for me but it got some notes oh very good you, but you got some notes uh oh he's uh, gonna get specific on some of the things that didn't make sense to me probably <laughs> there, there's a part where they say uh uh black holes gain mass i do not believe black holes gain mass uh, they do likely have infinite density this is true but they retain the same mass that they had when they turn in from a star into a black hole uh and that judge is god awful and i wanted to see her i wanted to see bad things happen to her um well, that's linda lavin from alice yeah it's alice i loved her what no about not, you, no no you're you're talking about an actress or an actor. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I'm not you're talking right. about the actor. I'm the talking about the, the character, role. the yeah. judge. Yeah. Um, yeah, John Boyega's like uh go, you know, coming up like he, here's here's what's going on, you know, he, here's what time it is, here's what this person's doing, and I believe in them. And the judge is like, I'm not hearing any of this, I reject everything you just said, fuck you, and he's going to it's like fuck off. Literally, okay. someone put a bolt in that judge's head. Yeah, I, I don't quite under and then, um, you know, it, it turns into a heist at the end, which that, that's kind of cool. I don't understand what this movie is, right? It's just <laughs> it, weird. It, it, it's got a it's got a bunch of like heist movies. I love heist movies. I love courtroom dramas. I love space shit, even though they got that wrong. But whatever. Mm-hmm. You it's know, a they're, bit of a relationship they're, they're, they're drama filming. too. Yeah, they're, they're filmmakers. They're not astrophysicists, nor am yeah. I. And I could be wrong about everything. Um, it's it, it has everything I'm interested in, but I don't know what it's supposed to be. They're just seeing uh, like, the- like with uh, with uh, uh, Annette or even Holy Motors, like is, you know, it, it has a bunch of ideas. It goes everywhere. But for some reason, it seems cohesive. Like it, it, I get the sense that Leo's cracks brings it all together. Like you might not understand it. But I'm gonna I'm gonna keep you within the themes. I'm gonna keep you you know uh, consolidated into what I'm trying to say, but give you enough room to kind of play around with ideas. This seems like it's kind of like a hey, just like just throwing random things in, but doesn't have the uh, doesn't Vision? have the cohesion. Uh, yeah, it do- doesn't have the means to bring it all together. It, it okay. kind of it kind of loses the thread a lot of the time. Um, but uh, to to Bruce's point, if this is on and you want to watch it, it, it's entertaining for sure. I just don't think it really comes together, and it it, it, it loses the it loses its thread pretty easy and often. So this is a slight recommend or not recommend for you? Th- this would be a, like Bruce said, if it's on, give it a shot. I wouldn't seek it out. Yeah, this movie has really good performances from John Boyega, and I think. Olivia Cook is the best part of the movie. Like Bruce Perky says, she does chew up the scenery as Leah. She has that whole New York accent <laughs> thing, and she just lets that accent slather throughout the entire movie. She, she's very good in this movie. She is an excellent actress and character in search of a good movie. This movie, Naked Singularity, I was thinking there's so many good scenes. There's one sequence. There's so many poten- potentially good scenes. There is a sequence in New York where there is a brownout in the subway. And that could have been a tour de force, beautiful moment that you would remember cinematically. But, you know, credit writer, director Chase Palmer for actually picking this material. And maybe he's not working with a lot of money. But still, to Eric's point, this movie doesn't have this level for me, this narrative cohesion. I felt like the filmmaker was handed or or, um, while he wrote the screenplay. Maybe he cared about this project, but I don't feel his blood and soul into this movie. This just feels like a movie that's it didn't didn't have the right tone for me. It just I was thinking all throughout this movie, if this was 
written, if this was directed by Steven Soderbergh with this heist movie situation in, and with this interesting cutting because Soderbergh does his own cutting and lensing a lot of times, this would have been a way better movie because all of the ingredients for Naked Singularity to be an awesome film, excellent actors, interesting storyline, gumbo plot of gumbo pot of a plot, it's all there. But like Eric says, it doesn't come together. And you know what? It has to it, that responsibility, that accountability, it falls on the filmmaker. So you guys give it a slight recommend, a little bit if it if it's on t- television or if it's on streaming. My recommendation is if you love. Olivia Cook and John Boyega see it, but personally, I would not recommend Naked Singularity. It was ni- at 93 minutes. It felt like a very empty experience for me. So laying down the law on Naked Singularity, opening wide and on demand. It's on demand August 13th. It is in select theaters August 6th. So yeah, but yeah, I loved Olivia Cook in this movie, but I think you guys liked it a little bit more than me. Okay, so now John, the next one up is John and the Hole. Okay, I am to be a come. It's a coming of age psychological thriller that plays out the unsettling reality of a kid who holds his family captive in a hole in the ground. The parents are played by Dexter actor Michael C. Hall and wonderful actress Jennifer L. or Ellie or L, who Bruce and I believe Eric Holmes they liked her performance or her work in most recently in Saint Maud. And there, the kid is played by Charlie Shotwell, who is by the way excellent in this movie all right sorry guys this is a this is a weird edit because i my wi-fi has been my wi-fi router is horrible but right now we're on with john in the hole it opens in theaters friday and it centers here's a here's a uh, plot synopsis it's a coming of age psychological thriller that plays out the unsettling reality of a kid played by charlie shotwell who holds his family captive in a hole in the ground the parents are played by michael c hall from dexter and jennifer l or ellie i forgot how to pronounce her name Let's just say Jennifer L. from last year's St. Maud, and also Thaisa Farmiga also stars as Lori, the their daughter. Okay, so that is the the premise. And Bruce, I think it's probably somewhere set upstate New York, somewhere in the forest or something like that. It feels like one of those type of yeah. It seems like some like pretty rich house, and they have some a little bit of land, and they're out in the nice, beautiful, you know, woods and stuff. Yeah, it's a gorgeous looking house. And I, you know, I hate nature with a passion. I, I just like malls and concrete and city. I'm a total city slicker, but I was envious of that house. It's directed by Pasquale Sisto. The writer is Nicholas Giacobone. And I was absolutely, I was messaging both Bruce and Eric while watching John in the Hole. I was showing my absolute disdain for the movie. I will talk about my overall review of this, but first let's get to Eric Holmes and hear what he has to say about John and the hole. I don't get it. This is a, this is a 15 minute short at best. And I, I just, I don't understand why this is a full length feature. Um, It's got some, you know, decent performances. And uh, again, it's a good 15 minute short, but I, I literally don't understand why this was made into a full length feature. I'm missing something clearly. Yeah, it's a good 15 minute short. Sorry about you, but what? Sorry. You know what, guys? Sorry. Let me just go try. Let me try it at a different internet situation. Hold on one second. You're going to hear it. Hold on one second. All right. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Eric, you were saying about this. It, it just didn't work for you? No, no. I do not like this movie. Um, it's uh, two hours. Should have been 20 minutes. Or at the very least, uh, the movie should have been condensed down into 20 minutes. And the rest of the movie should have been the fallout to that first 20 minutes. Um there's nothing here. There's good performances. There's a cool idea, but as a, f- this is not a feature length movie. And I don't know why they decided it should be. Most of your comments, Eric Holmes, there is a side story with a mother and daughter that is very elliptical. And you have to actually analyze what that story has to do with the main story. And in my opinion, for most people there, that, that little story, sub story will not pay off. And It was just, wow. So there's a lot, there's a big barrier of entry to John in the hole. And I, Bruce, maybe you liked it more than Eric did. Um, probably not much. Uh, here's, here's the deal. So you've got a character that's, I don't know, sociopathic or I don't know the diagnosis, so don't get mad at me, but you've got these kind of characters like you have in say funny games or something, right? Where you see that they're just kind of the kind of person that might tear the wings off a fly. They just kind of want to see how it works. So he has this concept 
that this is going to happen. He's going to do this thing and he's going to get his family down the hole. That's a high concept, right? But if you're going to have that high concept, then you have to have the guts to play through, right? And I think that's the thing. He got, they had the concept up to the point where the family's down the hole. And I think the setup to that, some of that was really creepy, like genuinely creepy. Like when he's testing how to drug his family, I thought that was creepy as hell. I mean, like, oh my God, this guy, he's, he will do anything. But I feel like the writer had either no imagination, sorry to say that to the writer, (laughs) the writer either had no imagination or they didn't have the guts to go all the way with this. Because if that character is going to be that, I don't know, evil or whatever you want to call it to to go to that first step, they're going to try all kinds of things out that are probably going to be really disturbing and really fucked up and dark. And if that's what you're going to do, just do it or make a different movie. Yeah. You know, instead we spent like another 90, 80 minutes just kind of, well, I mean, I'm going to say it, just kind of watching this kid hang around in a house eating pizza and shit. I don't, that's not interesting. And and on top of that, they keep repeating the same beats over and over again. It's, oh, son, what, what, like, uh, obviously the family doesn't know this is a son. They think someone's, they're assuming someone's forcing him to do this, which makes sense. But they're like, what What are you doing? And then the son leaves and then he goes, plays video games or eats pizza or does whatever. And they come in and like, son, who's forcing you to do this? And then he goes, plays video games some more or eats more pizza. I'm like, how many fucking more times do we need to see this happen? I get that movies need to be long sometimes. Sometimes movies need to breathe and, and they need to take their time and they need to develop characters. But when you're doing the same thing, over and over again you need to you know either cut it off it's like this is a story we're talking about bam 20 minutes and this is a short story we're talking about if you're gonna go full-length movie you need to say something and if you're just going to be saying the same 20 minutes over and 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 over again just tell the 20 minutes, do that well. And then bam, this is a fucking awesome short. But yeah, as this, it is, th- this is a very repetitive and kind of bad full length movie. So no recommend from Bruce Perky and no recommend from Eric Holmes. No. John in the hole. I absolutely endured this movie. And at the end of the movie, <laughs> we told that, you, you could just walk away. You'd be okay. <laughs> and at the end of the movie, I ended up liking it. I no, ended up liking this movie. Not. Yes. No. I, I you know what happened? What what flipped for me? Was, intervention time, Greg. Greg intervention. <laughs> no, what happened for me is I I started to not see me. I I was looking at, at looking at the movie as a horror thriller, some, some kind of some kind of pacing thing. At me. You know what? It became sort of a family drama for me. Just it's one of these dense thematic things that if you read into it a lot and you know what maybe my interpretation is wrong it was it brought up a, n- a lot of interesting points on what it means to be a parent and how to raise your child there's a there's a sequence in the movie where the child asks the mother played by what is her Jennifer L he asks her what you know what is it like to be a grown up and she she gives him sort of a half hearted answer and that answer reverber that's a domino effect and you realize that that becomes a domino effect and then he starts trying to, you know, maybe he is a sociopath, but by himself, he's trying to learn how to become an adult by pushing the envelope like a lot of kids will do when they, maybe some kids will do some immoral, amoral stuff. And maybe he's just a kid trying to sort out. I'm thinking, who knows? Because at the end, there's a lot of open ended questions regarding will this family survive or not? I, but I, I, well, no, yes. that ending, I, I, you had to I, say I, fuck you to that ending, though, right? <laughs> that that ending yeah. was pretty bad. But to, to Bruce's point, though, yeah. the 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 parts that you mentioned are good. I like that. But the question I ask is, what about the that's that's that can be told in that twenty minutes? Mm. What about the rest true. of the hour and ten minutes? That's true. Where, good point. Well, I mean that that the, the, t- there, there's still another seventy minutes of movie with nothing there or they're repeating that same stuff that they told in that, you know, and, and that, and that's, that's the biggest issue I have with this. This is a great short. This is not a, this is not a feature length movie. Yeah. You know, the sound design visual composition works for me at certain points. The thing with, to your point, Eric, the lack of pacing is, can be deadening to a lot of people. 
I, you know, it, it was dead to, to me for a lot. I, I have no idea why, why I ended up actually kind of liking this movie. This movie actually gets a slight recommend. If you're looking for something, in my opinion, if you're looking for something just to, it's like one of those things when we were in school, we get a, maybe we get a Nathaniel Hawthorne book and we just like, oh, I don't want to read the Scarlet Letter. And you read it and you go, yeah, I really don't want to read the Scarlet Letter anymore. But then there are things about it that you actually end up saying, oh, well, this is interesting with the way they see the world this way. And I liked some of the points that John and the whole raised. There is that subplot with a mother and daughter. I, we can't really, inspire, I mean, it's not even worth a spoiler discussion, but there's that subplot, which I thought didn't work. It ended up working for me because then it bolstered the actual narrative and you understand what the motivations were for the kid with, it, with by, by um, sending the parents down to the hole. But maybe that's just me. I might be the only one who likes John the Hole. Would love to hear what you guys think. I think my my house money is most people will agree with Eric and Bruce regarding the ultimate judgment on John the Hole. But I am one of the minorities who actually kind of like the movie, even though I was complaining all the way through. So. I, I, I would like to say that uh, to the filmmakers of John the Hole, if you're listening to this, I apologize. I did not want to talk about the movie at all because I did not like it. And I thought it would be best just to ignore it and walk away. But uh yeah, it, 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 it really it really sucks to dig on indie movies such as this one. But uh, OK, and yeah, and then- they, yeah, they, yeah, this one just didn't work. And um, I apologize to the filmmakers, but ho- hopefully they do better in the future or maybe uh, get something rolling in the future. That was nice of you to say to the filmmakers. I get again, I gave it a slight recommend. So no apologies needed. And you know what? Filmmakers, uh, you know, if you're listening to this and the actors, if you're actually listening to this review, I did not like the fact that actually Eric Holmes, when he was actually talking about this movie, he gave me he gave me and Bruce like about 20 pitchfork emojis when we talked about the review. So just that for <laughs> no, but that was very, I, <laughs> what you can say, Eric. That was very considerate, Eric. But anyways, this movie comes out and, Friday. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And yes. one one other thing, uh, I did not like John in the Hole. However, if you're one of the filmmakers and uh, you're listening to this and you want to come on the show and tell me where I'm wrong and I'm a stupid head and I didn't understand it, that, that we we often and we were talking about this, uh, we were talking about this uh, previously with Joe Russo. Just because we're doing the review doesn't mean that's the last word on things. You that's know, good. Good, I, point. good I, I, point. Artists, artists are allowed to join the conversation when the conversation yes. has been started. So, um, okay. if you are a filmmaker and you disagree nice. with what I say or I'm being unfair, feel free to come on Find Your Film and talk to us and call me a piece of shit and tell me where I'm wrong and I will listen to you. That is and fair if enough. You call him a piece of shit, and I'm stuck in a hole. I will know how to get rid of him. <laughs> that is fair enough that said i even though i'm the one who i gave this slight recommendation bruce perky did you ever think when those three people thaisa farmiga jennifer l and michael c hall were stuck at that bottom of the hole were you ever thinking you know what i'd rather just see them just talk improvise do do improv for about 90 minutes that'd be more interesting than i'm watching right now did you ever think about that because i thought man just them together all all three of those act all three of those are really good actors so there are, t- there are times when I was just frustrated with watching this movie. That's all I'm going to say. So I just thought about, you know, who would be eating who first. That's what I figured was going to happen. <laughs> who, would be, who would be eating who first? Okay, so that is our main reviews for this week. But we actually have another sneaky deaky review. This is The Green Knight, which I think Bruce Perky told me it's probably his favorite film of the year. And I don't know. I, I'm just I, I'm just based on that review. I'm so excited to hear what Bruce Perky has to say about the Green Knight. But first, let's start off with Eric Holmes because you've been the Green Knight lover for for months on end right now. Did this movie exceed your expectations, or did it just hit hit the target right on the spot? All right. So uh, first of all, um, I kind of I kind of know. Well, I've I've seen Anderson's review that he put on. Uh, he put on his uh, YouTube page and I got a good idea of what Bruce is going to say. And so, and some people, not, not everyone liked the green Knight. I have a very, very, very different take uh, than most people because I put the RPG game before uh, watching the movie. And after watching the movie, I knew what the ending was going to be. I knew kind of what the, what the uh, um, idea of the movie was going to be. So I kind of knew, 
almost almost exactly what to expect not exactly because the rpg game's a little different but uh imagine reading a script to a movie and then going to watch that movie you kind of you know scripts change but you got a good idea of of what to expect and so i got a lot of i got a different uh point of view from the green knight before watching it and then of course the uh, physical experience of going to the theater that I uh, lamented <laughs> earlier. Um, but overall, I really loved The Green Knight. It was uh, just basically like uh, playing the RPG game, you know, having, you know, different character, uh, so on and so forth. But it had, uh, you know, themes of honor and dishonor. And the uh, the ending, so with the rpg thing we had the first episode we'll have episode two three and four coming out eventually the ending to the green knight is very similar to how the game ends where you get you get to eat your cake and have it too oh we'll say um but yeah it, it does some it does some fun things with the uh you know playing with the uh morality and also i think this movie kind of uh this this movie or just David Lowry movies in general, I don't think a ghost story has done them any favors because I think a ghost story is very deep and kind of life changing in a lot of ways. And so when he comes out with a movie like Old Man and the Gun, and you know this like for, for from now until forever after a Ghost Story, I think David Lowry has has set a bar. And if he doesn't clear or meet that bar, it's going to be called, it might be considered unsuccessful. And I don't think that uh, Green Knight, even though it deals with uh, morality, it doesn't go that deep. It's a pretty simple story. The Green Knight's going to say, strike me down however you wish. And in one year, I'm going to return the favor. And that's pretty much exactly what the movie is. And during his uh, journey, to the green knight you know he get, he gets uh, met with certain you know certain mortal dilemmas and dispatches with those dilemmas as he sees fit until he meets the green knight and the ending happens but it's a pretty simple story i'm guessing most people listening to this is uh that wanted to see the green knight has already seen it uh if you haven't seen the green knight i would go into the with the expectation that you're watching pete's dragon as opposed to you're watching something on the level of a ghost story. Cause it's not going to, I don't think it's going to move you quite that way. Maybe a little bit, but more, this is just a straight, straight story. Mm. And that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. This would be a recommend for sure. But also I have a very different, uh, I had a very different lead up to this movie than most people did. So Bruce, from at, 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 at the end of the day, I have no idea. Yeah, Bruce, I've been reading a lot of reviews. It just seems like a, a big snooze fest, this movie. Like, it's not Excalibur. It's not Knights of the, it's not Knights of the Round Table. It's not like, so, you know, it's not even like First Night. It's like, you know, it's their whole meditative kind of journey thing. That's like, what do you think? Well, it's got great characters, a really rollicking adventure, unpredictable encounters. Um, oh, wait, that's the video series that Eric's doing. So <laughs> oh, go That's watch dun, that. Dun, 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 dun. Go Thanks. <laughs> um, no. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that cough. Sorry so about that cough. I, I had a really weird experience with this. So yeah, I definitely was disappointed with this. I, I think a lot of people are actually loving this movie. Wait, um, were you bored by this movie? Yes, I was bored by this movie. Um, the problem with this movie is that it sounds to me better on paper. And I was really actually serious. The encounters and the things they're doing in their video series so far is more entertaining to me than the movie was. Because to me, the movie, I, if it is a simple story, that's fine. It doesn't matter. But a simple story that's based, it's a, so if you have a simple story, that's a quest from basically most of the, the movie is from A to B, you know, starting at A, get to the Green Knight. And the whole point of that story is all these encounters along the way. Then all the encounters need to be really entertaining, exciting, engaging, fantastical. And on paper they are, but they really aren't. I was kind of bored by all of them. I, I, not all of them. I, I mean, there was points in there that were kind of cool, but other points were just kind of like, okay, that happened for way too long. Especially as, uh, there's a whole sequence at a, at a mansion with a, a, a couple um, and that was very long to me, just didn't go anywhere. And the other problem I have with this 
Um, and I can't say not to recommend this. I mean, this is a quality movie. It's got great acting. It's got beautiful production design. Okay. So this um, is a recommend for you. This is okay. Um, I Fair. would say this is a recommend for most people. It's not a recommend for me. Like this isn't, this is not a movie that I enjoyed. Um, my son didn't enjoy it, but a lot of people are going to enjoy this movie. I, my biggest problem with this movie is the, is the story. The story I think is actually kind of terrible. I think it, doesn't do well what it's supposed to do, which if I'm reading it correctly, it's supposed to be a redemption arc. It's supposed to be a, a fallen or a never risen character goes through the five virtues of a knighthood. Each of these tests is a test. Each of these encounters is a test for his virtue and his honor of, of knighthood uh, to see if he can basically gain the honor that he needs to be an honorable quote knight. That's kind of the goal of this movie. I think it fails at that goal or it doesn't even fail at that goal. I think the story, the, the finale that it gives, and I can't talk about it really. The finale it gives, I think is a cop out and actually a kind of a terrible message. If I read it correctly. This is I, you, I, you basically, you, you were talking about Muhammad Ali on the net. You basically were <laughs> thriller in Manila. You just got in the ring and you just knocked him out. That is, I love your reviews whenever they're, they're of this ilk. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, I could argue over it. I would have to talk about the ending to say how I think it fails. I think it right. fails. I think it fails in its morality. <laughs> wow. I think its morality is flawed okay. um, for a very specific reason. But um, uh, I can't say why, because it would really give you a lot of spoiler conversation after <laughs> the show. Spoiler <laughs> conversation after the show. I wish I saw the movie, man. That's my bad on that. No, I don't want to ruin it for you because you could, you'll probably really love this movie. There is a lot about this. I'll, oh, I'll love. love this movie. Oh, you, yeah, you, you, I... you should. You could. Yeah, oh. totally. I mean, it's uh, you know how it is with me and movies. Certain movies just hit me wrong. And if they hit me wrong, I am out. Yeah, yeah and you're out. <laughs> and I, this is kind of I, one of those movies. I, I will say that. Um, so with playing the, the RPG game, we have five different characters. Yes, you do. So we get five different endings, different ending for each character. And that makes sense. Uh, in the Green Knight, they have one character, and they get they get a and, couple bites at that same apple. And I would um, argue your characters are more engaging. No, but what what, what I'm saying is, uh, <laughs> uh, we really need a spoiler conversation <laughs> for this. Go on for the. Well, but, uh, okay. Uh, so I, is... I, I I would I kind of I kind of want to know what the the immoral portion of the ending was, but I got I got a I got a different take on the ending. But you again, love the, the, you the, love... the, the, then we'll Wait. have to we'll have to talk about it. So you love the ending, Eric. You love the ending. Yes, you thought yeah, it was... okay. yeah, a lot. And this is this a, is a lot that clarifies is this a strong recommend or is it just a recommend for you? Like not a strong recommend. Uh that this is a recommend. Uh, it's not strong recommend because I I think there's uh like Bruce thinks there's people like me that are gonna love it. I think there's people like Bruce that are gonna hate it. And that I mean you know, when, when you break it down, that's the, that's the love it or hate it. That's the mark of an interesting movie to say the least. Yeah. Uh, it's when, interesting for sure. Yeah. yeah. When, when, when you can, uh, when you can split people right down the line, just like that. Mm. Bruce, if someone said, Hey, you know, I, I have a Blu-ray copy of, of the green Knight, or I have dragon heart with Dennis Quaid and Sean Connery as a dragon. Which do you pick to watch? Oh, oh. oh dragon heart at a <laughs> drop of a hat. It's Very so much more fun. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool that you said that. Okay. My, my, my favorite part of the Green Knight, though, is at the end where he's like, where's the other Green Knight? And it's like, what do you mean? I am the last one. <laughs> well, put it this way. Uh, here's one little thing. By the way, oh, you, yeah, have ahead, entire, yeah. you have an entire, got an entire movie about knights. Not one sword hits another sword in anger. There is not one wow. battle in this entire okay. movie. Yeah. There's that's... not one fight. Okay. Okay. Uh, not one. That, there's a no. That, there's that, that, well, <laughs> again with the with, with the RPG game. Not to bring that up again, but I will. Because it's more exciting. <laughs> the RPG game's more exciting. I that, tell you. No, but that that's there's no real fights in that either. That, that, there's it, there's it, more it, interesting characters though. I'm just saying. <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> okay, so and, that and, is... and and also the Green Knight has one hundred percent less Holy Notes than the RPG. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that is the Green Knight. It's out in theaters right now. Eric says recommend go see it in theaters. Bruce says, well, there's going to be a lot of people who see it, but for you, Bruce, was that wasted money and wasted time for you? 
Oh, I mean, ever, seeing a movie like this is never wasted money. I mean, it's beautiful to look at. I mean, it's not wasted okay, time. Okay, cool, cool. I, movies, movies are rarely a waste of time for me. Okay. Have you seen and, Ed, Ed with uh, that movie, Ed, where, where uh, Matt LeBlanc <laughs> is in it? And, I haven't. But, <laughs> and you can saying, make me put it in the box if you want to. There, there's, <laughs> no, no. There's, a, I think, a chimpanzee. He's throwing pitches. Yeah, that made me really think about my life as a, as a I, journo. After I, did, watching I, that I, movie. Did I was depressed. Up- Yes, sir. I, I, I did want to bring up a certain close-up shot of a uh, of a oh, uh, sash. Yeah, of a sash. <laughs> the stunt come. <coach. laughs> ah, okay. that was that in good. reference to the Green Knight? Yeah, the, the, there was stunt come in it. It was really, really. You're kidding me? Not, really? not, oh. not, not, not expecting that. That um, is a, that is so funny. Now that is. A, yeah. And there, okay, you know, one of these days we'll do a spoiler on on the Green Knight. Obviously, Bruce is—I don't know if Bruce is going to be there for for the spoiler. I don't know if you want to. Do you, could you imagine yourself talking for another hour about the Green Knight, Bruce? Can you imagine yourself doing that? Sure, sure, I could do it. <laughs> okay, so well, that, 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 actually, that's what makes it perfect because, like, Bruce is like on the complete opposite spectrum right, that I am. Fair. So that those are when the spoiler conversation, when the spoiler conversations become interesting. Right. If it was just like, I like that part. Yeah, so did I. I agree with both of you. Then, but I mean, why, why even bother? I, I the one thing I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna air any of these sound bites that that Bruce Perkins provided regarding the Green Knight because I don't want the A24 army on our you know what's because there's so pe- there's so many people who believe every movie that A24 releases is a masterpiece. Which God love A24, but you know they they've had some um, mediocre ones down the road, but they they're usually a class act studio so i i I think where a24 shines is that they're they're always they're always kind of going for it you know they 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 definitely have a their movies have a specific kind of draw to them or look to them or whatever you know they're not always gonna when you do that they're not always gonna land but hey you know at least they're not following formula at least they're not you know i i guess they might be following formula to a degree but they seem to be taking chances and doing interesting things and you don't have to you don't have to love everything that they do but i i would say that you have to at least appreciate that they're trying to do something different they're trying to bring in filmmakers that are hey i got this i got this silly idea well let's let, let's say their silly idea was john in the hole you know i didn't like john in the hole but at least they tried you know at least they so, tried yeah at least yeah. they tried now Listeners, viewers, if if you're not going to go out this weekend and if you want to just hang out at home and watch something good on streaming, all three of us give a strong recommend or at least a solid recommend. I think, I'm not to put words in the mouth the mouths of Bruce Perkins or Eric Holmes, but we both, all three of us, really enjoyed the documentary Val, which is a look at the life of Val Kilmer. I've wanted to tell a story about acting for a very long time, about truth and illusion. A sermon is going to be about truth and illusion. The truth is, in order to find each character, I've had to put a little bit of me in them and find a little bit of them in me. I've lived in the illusion almost as much as I've lived outside of it. I have behaved poorly. I have behaved bravely. I have behaved bizarrely to some. I deny none of this and have no regrets because I've lost and found parts of myself that I never knew existed. And I am blessed. Forty plus years in the business, he grew up in Chatsworth, California. His due to a tracheotomy, his voice, he has like a voice box. He can't really speak any that much anymore. And when he speaks, it's almost indecipherable. So there's a little bit of subtitles here. So how, how are we going to actually pull off this documentary about, well, his son, Jack Kilmer, is a prominent voice in this movie because he literally provides that BO, the narration behind Val. We pre, we've already reviewed, given our reviews of Val, all three of us have really enjoyed it. So yes, Prime Video on August 6th, definitely check out Val because there's all of this really never before seen footage of Val Kilmer's home movies that you get to watch from a bunch of movies that he actually did throughout his career. And it's a very touching, touching documentary very quickly. Bruce, what did you love the most about Val? I I just really loved kind of the, 
like I said before, I think it's like a retrospective, but you get to see it from behind the scenes. So as you're slowly, and every time that new one pops up, you're like, oh, that's right. He was in that. I almost forgot he was in that. And then you watch it and you see the scene. You're like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And like Eric had um, kind of suggested, there's a scene um, in a certain movie with a certain very problematic, well, not problematic, but very <laughs> tough to work with actor that's infamous. That's pretty awesome. It's a very storied uh, set that he's part of. And this is the Island of Dr. Moreau. We're going to spoil it for you guys. The Island of Dr. Oh. Moreau, directed by John Frankenheimer. I'm sorry, because it's going to come up pretty soon anyway. The Island of Dr. Moreau, directed <laughs> by John Frankenheimer. Eric Holmes, just very quickly before we get into our, our picks. Well, but listeners, we're going to pick one or two. Each of us, we're going to do like a sort of a round table of each of us will give two picks of Val Kilmer movies you should check out after watching Val. But first, Eric, very quickly, your quick thoughts, thoughts on, on Val. What worked for for you regarding this documentary? Did everything work for me? I, when we reviewed uh, The Birthday Cake, for example, um, and I knew that he had the tracheotomy thing, I didn't know the extent of what he went through and uh, what his, uh, you know, the outcome of it was. But when I saw The Birthday Cake, I was just uh, happy to see him still doing what, you know, I, I was happy to still, there you go. The Birthday day. Cake on Blu-ray. Out this week on Blu-ray, just but, got uh, it, so. I, I was so happy to see him acting, and then watching Val, um, you know, and watching his uh, his son kind of do the narration for him, and kind of seeing him and his family, you know, uh, watching him go uh, back through his career was fun. Um, I was kind of disappointed when uh, they were doing the thing with Tombstone, and mm. he was uh, he was limiting that. Oh, I'm just this guy and I'm reliving my past. Well, um, for him and for anyone in his position that does that same thing, I would say to them that you're putting joy out in the world, you know, and that's a good thing. If you had one role, you only had one role and everyone loves that role. You know, you put joy in people's lives and someone wants to have you for a uh, hey, we're going to have a screening of your movie you did 40 years ago that everyone likes and people only know you as that one character. That's more than most people have. And that that's something to be uh, gracious about and happy about. Um, and I get that he wants to move forward uh, with his art. And I kind of hope that he does. He seems to want to do some stuff with uh, Mark Twain. And as we mentioned, Mark DeWisiak, does great Mark Twain. So maybe he wants to, uh, you know, maybe he wants to hook up with him and collaborate. But uh, yeah, I, I, I really like this. I don't think it's, uh, you know, it's not a, uh, you know, expose on the real Val Kilmer, you know, but it, it, it's got some, it's got some fun stuff, especially the Island of Dr. Moreau bit. And uh, it's got some uh, real personal stuff that I was already a fan and this just made me love him more. Okay, so that is Val. It again, August sixth via Prime Video. Check that out, and we're gonna get in, into each of us will pick two of our favorite or maybe favorite slash underrated Val Kilmer movies. But before we get to that, here is Jack Kilmer. I just interviewed Jack Kilmer and Val's daughter Mercedes Kilmer. I asked them what are some of their favorite or what is their favorite Val Kilmer movie or most underrated Val Kilmer movie, and here are them. Here's I don't know how to lead into this. Here is my interview with them. A little quick snippet. They talk about their favorite Val Kilmer movie. Here we go. I'm a huge fan of The Ghost in the Darkness and Spartan. I believe those two movies are among his most underrated films. Oh, cool. But just for you guys, just I'm, I know it's hard for you to, to judge your, your father's performances, but can, you, can each of you name a movie that you feel that is completely underrated among his body of, of work that you love? Island of Dr. Moreau, for sure. I think it's so cool. Brando, Frankenheimer, my dad, David Thewlis, really cool group of people, crazy backstory as well, which we see in the documentary. There's a lot of drama on set and my dad captured all of it. Um, excuse me, I'm getting a phone call. Um, yeah, I love that movie. And I think that's due for a renaissance. How about you, Jack? I go, I go doors all the way. Okay. Is it just because of that iconic performance or you're a fan of? I think he just really, it was a great performance and it's a great music movie. And I think there are so few. All right, guys. So Jack Kilmer, what do you think of Jack Kilmer's choice of the doors 
for for uh, Val Kilmer as far as favorite or underrated performances? What do you think? Do you think that's a an obvious choice? Did you like that choice for the Doors guys? What do you think? I mean, he he was clearly uh, he was clearly taken with the character of Jim Morrison. I've mentioned uh, previously. I'm not a fan of Jim Morrison based on his uh, based on his personal stuff, but as a performance. I would say that that was a very good performance as he na- he nailed it. Okay, and Bruce, what did you think of Mercedes's choice of the island of Dr. Moreau? That was the one movie <laughs> that she picked. And Val Kilmer's not even the main character in this movie. I thought that was a very interesting uh, well, choice. <laughs> it's a very, very unique movie. And like we talked about before, it's got such an incredible history. The Island of Doct- Dr. Moreau is probably one of those movies that's more fun to talk about and hear about than it is to actually watch to me. But um, but yeah, I can see that. It's a really odd movie. Some people, sometimes those weird, odd, not quite working movies click with people and I can see that. And he's yeah. awesome in it. I mean, he's great. He, he's, he always brings someone who could have been like the Hollywood pretty boy and kind of just done generic roles. Like he could have always been sort of like he was sort of in Top Gun, but he always brought something special and interesting to these roles that that's kind of set him apart. And when you see this movie, you really understand that he always kind of had that approach, an actor's actor's kind of approach. So that's, I think, why a lot of the stuff endures that he did. Okay. Speaking of that, that is a good segue to Eric's two choices of Val Kilmer films that you really enjoyed. Can you tell us what are your two picks and why? All right. Well, the first one I'll pick is uh, At First Sight. It's a movie where... Uh, he plays a blind guy and then he, uh, re- you know, sl- uh, goes through a procedure to get his sight back. And this is one of those movies. I think he came around around the time of Island Dr. Moreau or like within that, maybe within a couple of years of that. So it's, it, yeah. it's, it, it's a good thing that uh, we just, just talked about Island and Dr. Moreau because it kind of does that same thing with I, I loved Island and Dr. Moreau when I saw it in theaters. Yeah, I loved at first sight when I saw it in theaters. And then I come to find out later that these are air quote bad movies. I'm like, I don't understand. I <laughs> like the, both, both these, you know, that the Island of Dr. Moreau thrilled me. And at first sight um, kind of, uh, kind of got me by my heart light. And, you know, it, it's definitely kind of a, a chick flick if you want to call it that, but it, it moved me in a way and I haven't seen it in a long time, but you know, I, I he's good know. in it. Okay. And yeah. if I recall, that movie is directed by Erwin Ir- Winkler and it co-stars Mira Sorvino as his love interest. And yeah. he, he's blind. And Val Kimmer plays a blind person in the yeah. movie. I, I haven't seen it in years either. I remember actually surprisingly liking that film as well. And so what is your second pick? My second pick would be the David Mamet movie Spartan. And I was I, I was waiting to see if you would pick this because I didn't want to step on your toes, but I saw you were picking another one. So I'm going to pick it and Spartan is awesome because before Eric starts, let's fo- um, folks and Bruce, there's only one movie that we need to pick for Val Kilmer. And that is Spartan because he is the man in Spartan and everything else is second and third. Eric Holmes, let's hear what you got to th- say about Spartan. Spartan's got three things. Oh, four things going for it. It's got David Mamet. It's got Val Kilmer. It's got William H. Macy. And it's got Ed O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah the, the, this movie is like a, a a total tough guy movie but that's kind of where uh david mamet shines um just in general it's a uh, a, uh one of those uh you know I, I i work for the government and i'm a soldier and this is the person i am well they're fucking you up and they're gonna fuck you over okay change of plans we're gonna <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna uh you know uh go against everything and it, it it's silly but it, it's kind of fun and val kilmer's uh work in this is is uh he plays a pretty good tough guy which is kind of what you need to be in a david mame movie <laughs> david mame you know actually someone actually someone actually doing a, a press junket actually called him david mame accidentally <laughs> i can't believe well, that pit- and people to this day still call Sidney Lumet Sidney Lumet. And I did too before I heard him say it out loud. I was cool. like, oh, I guess he's not French. That's true. And again, Spartan, again, Val Kimmer, most un, in my opinion, most underrated performance yet. I, I just think it's amazing. He, Him speaking, the mammoth tone, the inflections, that dialogue, he is just perfect. My only regret was Val Kilmer didn't star in more David Mammoth films. He is Ma- perfect. Mammoth. Mammoth films. 
All right. So Bruce, how about you? What are your two picks? Well, I thought about, I mean, a ton of roles, obviously that, that everyone has loved in, you know, throughout his career, but I thought about, well, you know what I really like a lot of times is the roles where he's not the lead. He's not the head guy. He's either the co-star. He's even maybe a smaller role. So I thought I'd highlight a couple movies where he's smaller roles, but he just adds that extra Val Kilmer, <laughs> you know, goodness to the movie that would already be good, but he just makes it better. And I think that's a great sign of an actor where they don't have to be the star the the head lead to like, you know, shine, they can shine or even make it better sometimes when they're not the, the star of the store. So for me, I brought up, um, Bad Lieutenant, Port of Call, New Orleans, <laughs> kind of like uh, still haven't seen that Eric's, one. kind of like Eric's list. I mean, you've got Herzog, Cage, and Val Kilmer <laughs> in a movie. And for my money, this movie Iguanas. is. I was just gonna say this movie is fantastic. And even if the movie doesn't quite work for you, a couple sequences are so amazing that they stand on their own. And one of them is with iguanas or are they lizards and that has val and cage in it and it's it's amazing and there's another scene with a a a, a soul that's still dancing if i remember correctly um there's a bunch of other <laughs> such stuff in this movie there's a scene where um it's like i think as a building is flooding and i think uh that val is is key in that scene as well it's 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 a great movie and really odd and much better than any thing based on the original, I guess, based on the original Bad Lieutenant should be. And then second, I think we underestimate uh, Val Kilmer as a comedian. And I mean, I loved him in the original, you know, the first movie he did in Top Secret, but he's just as funny in a smaller role in MacGruber <laughs> as the evil villain, um, Dieter von, this ends with TH, Dieter von Kunt, <laughs> I'm gonna say it very clearly, um, and you just watch him going toe to toe with MacGruber in some of the scenes, and they're just hilarious. And he's playing kind of the supervillain, but he's really hamming it up. And both of these movies, he's in scenes where he's not the biggest personality in the scene, but yet he still holds his own. And I think it's uh, there's some pretty good stuff to be found there. And some people may not have even remembered he was in those movies, and if they or if they had never seen him. So go back and check those out. Well, here's a lightning round for our Cinematics Facebook group. I asked that question today, last minute. And as always, our group members came through. Pete Abeda, one of the trio of the middle class film class. He agrees with you, Bruce Perky. He, he actually posted a link, a YouTube link, an NSFW link of McGruber. So that was his choice. And Alec, this is how much, this is lightning round. This is how awesome Val Kilmer is. Check this out. Alec Vas Vasquez, he mentioned Heat, his performance in Heat. Love that. Dave Onmacht, he said, loved Thunderheart. I have not seen Thunderheart. So that's another movie. I don't know if you, you guys have checked out Thunderheart yet. Mm -hmm. And Matt Stillman is saying he's, as of today, he's rewatching Top Secret. He's going to rewatch Top Secret yes. on Amazon Prime. Yes. Of course, Tombstone from Brent Watson. And that, I believe, oh, and Nathan Day, author, yeah, author Nathan Day picks Willow. Picks Willow. I've never seen Willow. And have you guys uh, do you, any thoughts on Willow? Uh, was that George? What is that? George, George Lucas? Who did Willow? Ron Howard or something? Ron, uh, Ron Howard. Ron Howard. I think Ron it was Howard, written, yeah. probably written by George Lucas. Yeah, um, but yeah, but so. yeah t Tombstone. I, I knew Tombstone was coming somewhere, so I, I left it off. But that's really my pick. As that's is oh, wow. Port of, as is Portocal New Orleans. Oh, but uh, wow. but Tombstone is so good. It's like you so drunk, you probably seeing two of me. That's why I brought two guns, one for <laughs> each of you. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good, Eric Holmes. And of course, last but not least, Andrew Dykstra. Really, oh, can you believe Angie Clark? You just at the last minute you mentioned Spartan. Good, kudos to Angie Clark for mentioning Spartan. That, that, that's because that's because she's the best. <laughs> yes, definitely check out our Angie when Angie Clark was with us and we actually did that Mon Monty Cliff mo movie. What was that Monty Cliff movie again? Wild River. Also, yes. last but not least, Andrew Dykstra mentioned. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang mm. for Val Kilmer. So, so many great roles, great performances, great movies from Val Kilmer. Again, August 6th for Prime Video. We are closing. Up. Yes, Eric, you're going to say something. I So I mentioned, did I say Tom Sawyer or did I say Mark Twain earlier? You said Samuel Clemens, actually. No, I'm kidding. Okay, you, you, didn't say, you didn't say, no, no, uh, Mark Twain. Say, say, you didn't say, uh, you didn't uh, say. Okay. I, I, in, in the back of my head, I'm like, I just called Mark Twain. Tom Sawyer. I think that was <laughs> no, no, you didn't. You didn't, no, you didn't. You didn't do that. If yeah. I did, 
you know what I meant, Samuel Clemens. Right, and 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 his work is he, Barry Valkymer is a lifelong fan of Mark Twain's writings, and he's actually performed him on stage. Oh, my final pick, by the way, is of course like you guys mentioned, the birthday cake. It's on Blu-ray and DVD right now. Check it out on Blu-ray. You know what the thing is goes goes back to what Bruce Perky was saying. The lead is Shiloh Fernandez. He's very good as this sort of just normal guy who is who he's trying to escape the whole criminal world of New York and his mob family. And he's overmatched by a lot of these guys. And a lot of these guys are really tough guys. All-star cast, Val Kilmer, without that voice, just that trick, trick out of me, and you, you can barely decipher him. He, he really shines in a supporting role as the mob boss because he just has that presence about him. He just knows what he's doing. And the birthday cake, I think all of us gave it a pretty, pretty, you yeah, know, all of us recommended it. I and yeah. really enjoyed. I, I, and I, I think that uh, his, uh, his new voice kind of, uh, it really leans into that kind of character like yeah. a little more that character is not the same without that without that you know it adds that little extra spice to it i think oh very cool so yeah eric is also definitely going back to our initial review eric Holmes singled out the performance of val kilmer in the aforementioned the birthday cake and my final my final pick the final pick for val kilmer is mm-hmm. of course directed by stephen hopkins co-starring michael douglas highly underrated film Headlined by Val Kilmer, The Ghost and the Darkness. As, as of this recording, it's currently streaming on Amazon Prime Video. This movie is so awesome. And I don't know why this movie doesn't get more love. There's, you know, it's set in Africa. I think it's the, the years 1866. They're trying to build a bridge in Africa. And you see, when you look at these panoramic shots, it's gorgeous. It's like a Sergio Leone film, like Once Upon a Time in, in the West. It's really gorgeously shot. A lot of extras, they probably put a put a ton of money into this movie i don't know if this movie was a big hit here's the one here's the one warning it stars val kilmer and michael douglas do you guys know what the big surprise regarding the ghost in the darkness is i guess it's sort of a little bit of a surprise do you guys know it all no. michael douglas shows up doesn't show up until 46 minutes into the movie oh that, yeah that, that's right. like whoa yeah it took forever for him to show up but anyways if, if you want a really interesting action movie with an epic background i would definitely check out the ghost and the darkness because they're basically the ghost is a, a, kill, a lion who, who eats people and the darkness is is another lion who eat, basically two lions who eat people that's yeah, eric I, the, 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 I thought you were gonna say the big surprise was michael douglas is actually kirk douglas in this movie <laughs> oh that that, I mean, that would have made you rewatch it immediately <laughs> and that is that is val val kilmer our, our valapalooza we are closing the show off with bruce porky and your Oh, wait, before we do that, what does Peter Beta do every week? Eric Holmes? Yo, Pete, drop that beat. Who's in the box? Oh, what's in the box? You lie! No! What's in the fucking box? Bruce, what is your box pick this week? Well, we missed you is, last week. We missed yeah, you last week. So it's yes. delayed. It's delayed for a week, but we're, we're finally to it. And it is. Um, so it was suggested by Alice, Alice Doyard, who did uh, produced Colette, um, mm-hmm. the short Oscar winning short documentary feature from this year. And I had asked her at the time that we interviewed her to suggest a movie. And so she suggested a French animated feature called Les Maîtres du Temps, also means the Time Masters by Rene Laloux, made in 1982. And um, I believe Eric watched it too. So Eric can chime in on this. Um, this is a, <laughs> well, this is a, a pretty trippy, uh, pretty interesting movie. So I was watching this movie. Uh, the basic concept is this. You got this little kid named Piel, or Peel, I think they call him. Um, his dad is driving like this, this vehicle on this alien planet and the, the vehicle crashes and the dad is dying and he gives his kid uh, a communication device looks kind of like an egg and he says you know keep this and i'm going to send someone to help you and the kid walks off into the the wilderness of this alien planet and that the dad calls his cohorts on another spaceship to come and save his kid and the basic part of the movie is when they and the and that other spaceship has the communicator to communicate with the kid so they can communicate with the whole time and, and find out how he's doing and what he's doing while they're on adventure to come get to him. And that's kind of the basic concept of this movie. Um, 
some of the you know acting is kind of clunky the animation's older but it's hand drawn so it has that charm to me it has a charm uh, a little bit of a roughness but also a little more creativity because it's all hand drawn and most important of all i think that the um the worlds that you get in this are really cool looking really interesting um, they're all designed by this guy named uh, Jean, quote, Mobius Giraud. And I did a whole deep dive on this guy. You probably saw I posted it on Cinematics because I was watching it. I was like, this seems like an old um, heavy metal magazine, like sketches and heavy metal magazine, like stories and stuff. If anyone's seen that, that kind of style. And lo and behold, he'd done a bunch of covers for heavy metal magazine. And then I found out he'd done like the art design and, and, and character sketches and stuff for things like the original version of Dune that was going to be done by um, Jodorowsky. Uh, yeah, by Jodorowsky. Then mm. he got sucked into some of the character design and stuff for Alien, along with everybody in the world, apparently. And he kept going and he did stuff for Tron. He did stuff for the Abyss. He did stuff for the Fifth Element. This guy has got his fingers in all of these big like oh, that's amazing sci-fi and fantasy things from the 80s anyway i think this is a pretty pretty um awesome kind of sort of family but not adventure very kind of trippy at times you can see how it could have been a midnight movie and i think it has a kind of cool twist at the end too i was surprised that it actually had such an interesting twist anyway i'd like to hear what eric thinks of it <laughs> <laughs> pretty good yeah, this this movie's uh um I I'm trying to trying to piece together like th this movie has kind of an emptiness to it not not like emptiness in concept or characters or artistic the world seems empty outside of where the people are uh mm -hmm. or where the people are in 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 that moment that is to say once they if they leave their area I feel that there's a long way to go before anyone shows up so there's a bit of a little bit of agoraphobia to this kind of filmmaking um old transformers cartoons kind of has that like you had the battles between the the autobots and the decepticons but i get the feeling that there's nothing outside of that like for a long time um but uh yeah this this movie is trippy and yeah <laughs> <laughs> the the one character that gets the kid to swim we'll just say that <laughs> this goes in places where i'm like oh you son of a bitch i can't believe you're going there that's awesome. <laughs> what about those two little uh, but, uh, whatever they were yeah, those this, two little things you know i'm talking about those two little things yeah that they're kind of uh, your thoughts and stuff they can and they have uh, I mean, we were talking about morality with the Green Knight. There's, there's some odd thing. Given what those characters are, there's some odd conversations that they have with each other. That's actually really interesting and can only happen with those type of char like characters set up in that sort of way. Yeah, this, this. I don't think it would be for everyone, but uh, it, it, like the style definitely hits some nostalgia. And it's just so fucking bonkers. I don't know why you wouldn't check this out. Okay, so that is a, a pretty solid recommend from Bruce and Eric. And uh, yeah, so long as you, I mean, it's pretty good. Pretty good. As long as you, I think that's a nice sound effect, sound design there with the Eric Holmes. But what is your next? We're gonna pick now for what's in the box. What's yeah, in the? It's been a while. We haven't what's done in the it. Box? What's in the box? Oh, what's in the box? What's in the box? No, is there know. even a box? I don't know nice. what our box is. And if there is a box, what is in it? I don't know. Eh, eh. Yeah, hang on. I can't look. I can't look. Hang on. Can't I'm look. Don't. Grabbing one. <laughs> okay. Well, the aforementioned Joe Russo's pick came up. Okay. Ingrid Goes West. There you go. Okay, Ingrid Goes West. Not bad. Not bad. Okay, so yeah. that's what we watch for, for Bruce Perky with Ingrid Goes West. I have, you know, I was going to say for next week, we're, we're going to be treat you guys to a director spotlight. We're going to redo a redux of Walter Hill, and we're going to cover the movies, The Long Riders, and Geronimo. But I was thinking about this. Our first director spotlight was via courtesy of Eric Holmes, and our first director spotlight was William Friedkin. And I was thinking of actually doing a circular back and thinking, of just instead of doing the Long Riders and Geronimo from, from Walter Hill, I was thinking, I wanted to throw this to you guys. Let's just cover William Friedkin yet again, one more time. It's been a year since we've covered William Friedkin. And sure. why don't we go with Jade and The Hunted, since Bruce hasn't seen The Hunted. Yes. What do you think of those, do you think of those two? And I haven't I, seen Jade. 
I haven't seen Jade. Oh my God. I saw Jade in the theater. Jade is, uh, I won't say anything. Okay, good, good. Eric, I, what do you, I, what do you I think? literally just watched I literally just watched Jade uh two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're you're ready. It, well, well, it was gonna be one of my recommends and I kept pushing it and pushing it, and then now you say that we're doing Will and Freaking and we're watching Jade. I'm like, I'm ready. <laughs> okay, you're ready. Now you, all you gotta do is watch the hunted, and I'm sure the hunted is something where we're we're gonna talk about the hunted, but let's just say, yeah, the hunted is uh going to be interesting. I used to actually play play basketball with a guy who was, I think, a stunt coordinator. And he was talking about how I think he was working on the set of The Hunted. And because of there was a knife situation and Mm. Del Toro got hurt on the set and he actually had stopped production for a while on The Hunted. So it'll be interesting to see what Bruce Perky has to say about The Hunted. And we'll be just, you know, this is the both The Hunted and Jade were during the, the era where William Friedkin was pretty much really doing a great, uh, great job uh, being a studio filmmaker for Paramount Pictures, where his wife, Sherry Lansing, I believe was the, the head of the studio for a while. But that is it. Eric, anything else to say before we get out of here? Uh, yeah. Uh, Juan Diego Escobar Zate is going to be on the show in two weeks. And so if you want to check out Lose the Flower Beevil, uh, I believe it's on streaming on Shudder. And check it out on Shudder. Or uh, you can... Uh, buy a DVD online or check it out. But we will be talking full spoilers when we do talk to them. And it's going to be awesome. I cannot wait. I'm very, very, very excited about this. And we'll have posters and DVDs to give away of Lose the Flower of Evil as well. That's going to be so awesome. Very, very awesome. Bruce, as always, per usual, you didn't get to do this last week, but final thoughts from Bruce Perky. Okay. So I think, I don't know. I think that was, that was a, just do so it. Just know. do it. Okay. Take a risk. So maybe, I'm not going to take a risk. <laughs> I'm not going to take a risk. Right. <laughs> so maybe, how about that? That was a very good one. You know what? We're going to end now. And then uh, by the way, before you, you hear this, Bruce actually said, saying so may we end 500 times. So I'm going to give him one little snippet for the music licensing guys. So daddy kills people. <laughs> daddy. daddy. Okay, that's even better. We'll see you guys next week on Find Your Film. Take care.